Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? This morning, we're going right back to Song of Solomon 2.10, the particular verse that we highlighted, the one that I kind of put some more emphasis on in the last video or then yesterday's evening or morning devotion. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. So we already read these. There's no reason for us to go over again. We literally just did them yesterday. The point is this verse. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Let's see what the devotion has to say on this. Lo, I hear the voice of my beloved. He speaks to me. Fair weather is smiling upon the face of the earth, and he would not have me spiritually asleep. While nature is all around me awakening from her winter's rest, he bids me rise up, and well he may, for I have long enough been lying among the pots of worldliness. He is risen. I am risen in him. Why then should I cleave unto the dust? From lower loves, desires, pursuits, and aspirations, I would rise towards him. Basically, worldly things. He calls me by the sweet title of my love. It counts me fair. This is a good argument for my rising. If he has thus exalted me and thinks me thus comely, how can I linger in the tents of Kedar and find congenial associates among the sons of men? He bids me come away, further and further from everything selfish, groveling, worldly, sinful. He calls me, yea, from the outwardly religious world which knows him not and has no sympathy with the mystery of the higher life. He calls me. So this verse... And I told you yesterday what it what it seems to be speaking. But, of course, the initial meaning is this. I, uh, to me, it seems like it's saying even more. But the, the initial meaning is, come out of the world. Come away from all this stuff. And go stand with Christ. And we can do that while living in the world. It's a spiritual movement. <clears throat> Sometimes physical, but mostly spiritual. Uh, come away has no harsh sound in it to my ear. For what is there to hold me in this wilderness of vanity and sin? He's getting a little bit into Ecclesiastes there. Oh, my Lord, would that I could, I w could come away, but I am taken among the thorns and cannot escape from them as I would. I would, if it were possible, have neither eyes nor ears nor heart for sin. And that's a lot of us. We were, I wish I didn't sin anymore. I wish I didn't have the ability to do anymore. I hate myself for sinning. I hate my sin. That's a good thing. Thou callest me to thyself by saying, come away. Now here's where he's getting into some wording that seems to indicate rapture. Because there's a verse in the Bible, I forget where it's at. Jesus is going to call us unto himself. It might be 2 Thessalonians 2. Thou callest me to thyself by saying, come away. And this is a melodious call indeed. To come to thee is to come home from exile. That's rapture. To come to land out of the raging storm, to come to rest after long labor, to come to the goal of my desires and the summit of my wishes. That's rapture. We're going home to be with the Lord. But Lord, how can a stone rise? How can a lump of clay come away from the horrible pit? Oh, raise me, draw me, because he's the one that snatches us out of here. Thy grace can do it. Send forth thy Holy Spirit to kindle sacred flames of love in my heart, and I will continue to rise until I leave life and time behind me and indeed come away. So I, I sense hints of rapture there, because that is what it is. We're leaving to go and to be with him. But what's the core understanding here? So obviously, by the words the devotion writer used, he seemed to be indicating a little bit of rapture too. At, there at the end. But what's the core meaning of the verse? To come away from the world and go and attach ourselves to the Lord. To not be a part of this world and the things that it does. Now, of course, there's some things you have to do. You have to work. You have to make money. You have to pay bills. You have to go to the grocery store. You have to mow grass. You have to do all that stuff. But what he wants us is he wants us spiritually. To detach from this world spiritually and be attached to him spiritually. Now, what will happen as a natural concourse 
is that you will naturally start to come away from things of the world if you are attached to him spiritually. Because the draw of your spirit being already attached to him and you being godly minded, the natural draw is going to pull your flesh along with it. So your flesh is going to want to be a part of the world, but if you are so enraptured with the Lord and attached to him and, and your spirit, you're hanging out with him, your flesh is going to start to pull back with you because we're still attached together with our flesh. That's going to draw us out. And so there's a lot of things in the world that aren't, aren't going to bring us enjoyment anymore. There's a lot of things we used to do that were fun that aren't fun anymore. There's a lot of things that just don't get catch our attention anymore because we are caught up with him. That gives us more attention. I tell you, if somebody suddenly comes up and gives me a, a really nice bay runner boat, a deep hull bay runner that I can take down to the coast and go fishing, and a bunch, you know, I've got good fishing gear, but new fishing gear, lures, just packs the boat with everything. Everything paid for, all expense paid for trip. You go down and go fishing for the week. I would love to have a boat. I find that that would be very enjoyable. I've never, but one time in my life, fished on a boat, ever. And I was a kid when that happened. I've always fished from shore. I've always wanted, I want to get a boat. I want to get a boat. So if somebody did that, let's say somebody came up and said, it's all yours. Everything, full setup, it's all yours. And everything's paid for. Tax paid for. We're paying for the tag tile license and we're giving you money for gas to go down to the coast and go fishing for the weekend or for a week, whatever they, they set it up as. And then on the other side, somebody says, hey, we're starting a Bible study. And we're getting, we're going to go really deep into the scriptures. We're going to look at the original language. We're going to come together as brothers and sisters, actual believing brothers and sisters, and look at this word and find the mysteries hidden within it. I honestly can tell you I would have more pleasure with that Bible study than I would with the boat going fishing. The last two times I, I went fishing the last couple of years, most times I was completely distracted because I was... I was so much more focused on this. I mean, the whole time I was with my wife and son, I, I, and I, it was funny because I was the only one that caught fish, but I was focused so much more on, I've got videos i got to put out. When I went down there with my brother, I've got videos i got to put out. If you, if you saw that when I actually was on the beach and I did a video on the beach. I can't, I have to stop what I'm doing to go do something else. I've been out on the road and not going to make it home in time to do a video. And you guys know, you've seen them. I've stopped on the side of the road and done it. Some of them, you got to see where I was. Some of them, you could hear it. No matter what I'm doing, my mind, and I can't help it. My mind is always focused on him. My mind is always focused on what we're doing here. And so I'm distracted from everything there. It's all, it's so weird too because even when I feel like I'm I'm just kind of plugging along, it's like my brain is hypersensitive to anything that would remind me of something I could do a video on. And all of a sudden I'll hear a verse or somebody will speak a series of words or I'll see it. on Like my the tongue of my trailer that I got from when I bought that tractor. Salvation trailers, you know. Stuff like that starts to suddenly stand out. He is always on my mind as to what I should do, what he desires me to do. What is the right thing to do in this situation? What are the right words to say in this situation? That's always on my mind and I can't help it. That's being attached to him. Because you, you, the overwhelming thought in your head is that. That's being attached to him. And the closer you draw, the more that happens. It's not something that you do on your own. It's, it's something that happens. It's a natural progression. It's something that he does. He draws us closer. Just like these verses say. But when that happens, your desires for everything else just seem to fly away. I, I tell you this from my own personal experience. When I have conversations with people, if it's not something particularly important that, that needs my attention, I'm pretty indifferent to it. I'm just not worried about it.
I only go and do the things that I have to do. Otherwise, I don't want to do anything. I'm not interested in what the world wants. And that's just me. Because I'm so much more focused on this now. And people think it's selfishness. People think I'm, I'm just ignoring them. That's not that. I'm, I'm distracted with Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Now, we don't shirk our responsibilities. We don't ignore the, the, the tasks that we must do. But we can be completely caught up in him, even in those. This is what I talk about when I'm saying that you are glorifying him in everyday things in your life. Because when, you're, when you do them in, from the perspective of, I'm doing this to honor God. When you do them from a place of integrity. When you do them according to what the Lord desires us to do. That's the wrong way to do it. That's the right way to do it. You know how many people will go and they'll, they'll pick a certain task. And they'll do it just good enough. That's ah, good enough. I don't want to do it anymore. Or somebody that will go out there and say, I'm not stopping until I get it done right. And they go out and they do it exactly the way it's supposed to be. And they, if they find they make a mistake, they fix it. And they don't stop until they're done. That's the difference between somebody who's doing something to glorify God and somebody who isn't. Because that person that's that's trying to do it the right way and sees mistakes they make and are trying to fix them, that's somebody that's walking in integrity. The other person isn't. And it can be something as simple as mowing your grass. You know how many people I know that when they mow their grass, they leave all these little mohawks everywhere? Go back and mow over it again. I run over and over and over and over my grass. My wife does too when she does it. When you're driving down the highway, people find it, oh, everybody else is speeding. That's not the right answer. What does integrity tell you to do? To do the speed limit. The speed limit is 55, 65, 70. Do the speed limit. We've got a highway here called uh, the Toll Road 130 here in Texas. And one part, one part of it, I think like two-thirds of it, is 85 miles an hour. I still only do 80. That's the fastest I'll go. But do you know when I'm driving down that highway, there are people doing 100 and 110 on that highway? What's the point of a speed limit if nobody's going to bother to follow it? But it's like it's a challenge. Oh, that's the speed limit? Let me see if I can get away with doing over that before I get caught. When I'm on the highway going to the VA, 70 mile an hour on South 410. People doing 90. I mean, it's dangerous to do the speed limit, depending on where you are. But you know what? I'd rather do that. I would rather do it the right way. We honor God in this when we do the things the right way, when we walk with integrity. The Bible talks about this over and over again. This is something the Lord is calling us to do. He's calling us away from the world. The world says, oh, it's okay if you go over. God says, no, if that's what the law is, that's what you do. Abide by the laws of the land. Be subject to ruling authorities. You know, there's, there's a bunch of movements out there of people that think they don't have to do that. But this is so funny, though, is when they say that, they, they claim they're doing God's work. How is that God's work when God tells you to be subject to the ruling authorities, not protest them? How is that God's work when he's saying you need to ob abide by the law of the land? So it's wherever land you're at, instead of violating it. What they're doing is selfishness, and it's very worldly in nature. The godly people will... The godly people, if you're not looking for them, you almost might not be able to catch who they are until you pay closer attention and see, wait a minute, like everybody else is going over the speed limit. That guy's going the speed limit. That's probably, probably a godly man. Or at least he's godly in nature because he's doing the right thing. We do the right thing by our, by our wives and husbands. We do the right thing by our children. We do the right thing by our friends and neighbors and other family members. What's the right thing to do? That's what I'm going to do. And you're going to get hated for it. But this is what the Lord is drawing us away to. Come away. Rise up and come away. Come away with me. Come away from the world and come and sit with me. And from our perspective, that would be us spiritually sitting with him. But our bodies are still here in this world. That's okay. But all of a sudden, when you do that spiritually, that body will start to follow you. You got a, you got a, a bull 
and he just will not go the way you want him to go, or a donkey, or they're stubborn. Put a bungee cord around his halter and pull and stretch that bungee cord out. Eventually, the animal will start to give in to the pressure and swing over to you. We do that with horses. A horse, it, a lot of horses, unless they're trained properly, are scared to get on a horse trailer. And so, and what a lot of people do, they pull really hard on the reins. When I get on the trailer, I get up on the trailer, and I reach my hand out so they can see me, and I touch their nose, and they smell my hand. And then I walk up, and I have gentle pressure on the lead rope. And so I'll back up onto the trailer, and I'll give them plenty of room, stand off to the side, and I'll pull on that lead rope, and I just give gentle pressure. And they'll hold back and hold back until they realize everything's fine, and then they just, eventually they come right on the trailer. The analogy fits perfectly. The Lord takes us spiritually to this place, and then eventually our body gives into the pressure and starts to pull that way. And so we start to become godly people naturally in the world. Coming away from those things we shouldn't be a part of. Not having anything to do with those things that we shouldn't have anything to do with. And walking in a way that is more congruent with his word, and in a way that fulfills his will for us. This is what Jesus is calling us to do. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Come away from the trappings of this world. Come away from the thorns and the briars and the brambles of this world, constantly hooking onto your skin and your clothes and pulling you in another direction. Come away out here into the meadow where it's easy to walk. Don't deal with that stuff no more. Stay away from that stuff. I can't tell you how happy I became when I got off social media. Social media has been a bane of my existence. And I'm so glad I'm not on it. And there's people still trying to find me. And they'll contact, they'll find my wife and I'll... Tell them I'm not. Tell them I'm not on social media. They look for me everywhere. I'm not on there, guys. I'm happy to not be on there. I don't go party. I don't go hang out with people. I'm just a couple of friends I talk to. I stay here at home. Stay away from the world. But that's something the Lord is pulling pulling it out in me. He's dragging my spirit over to this place. My flesh is following. So, that, And that's what he wants for all of us. Don't, don't pay attention to the world. Don't be focused on them. Don't be looking at all these disasters. We had volcanoes erupt the other day. They're watching several others. They're, saying they're about to go. They've got a, a, a vent at the bottom of the ocean in the Pacific that's pushing out this uh, certain type of, of water. And it's a lubricant between tectonic plates. They say that we're looking for a massive earthquake. It's all the setup for a great big earthquake in the tribulation. And the seals especially is the first one. It's all happening. Everything. Stars, the moon. I mean, there's so much stuff going on. You can't keep up with it. Wars. All these people losing their mind. And the Lord is like, come away from all that. Don't pay attention to that. I mean, you obviously watch. I told you to, when you see these things, but don't make that your focus. Make me your focus in this time because if we keep our eyes on him, those things won't distract us. If we keep our eyes on him, we walk on water. As soon as we look away at the world around us, we start to sink, just like Peter did. And so these things, it's okay to look at these things and see what's going on, but that's not the center of our focus. Those, that's interesting. Cool. Great. I see what time we're in. I don't need to put my care or my concern into any of that. I need to just keep my focus on Christ. My concern is what he's doing. My concern is what's going on with him. There are people out there doing videos going on and on and on about all the weather and all the stuff that's happening. and <clears throat> They just make a huge to-do about what this is pointing to and all that stuff. And that's fine. But that's not the focus. The focus should always come back to Christ. Guys, don't worry about these things. It's, it's irrelevant. We already know we're in the time frame. We already know the signs and what they're going to show us. This doesn't matter. Our focus must be on Jesus Christ. I would love to see people take in their videos and bring everybody back to that focus. Let's go back to Christ. Let's stay focused on him. These things are what they are. They're t telling us he's closer. <clears throat> They're telling us it's almost time. We're going to focus on what Christ told us to do 
when we see these things happen, what are we supposed to focus on? Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Read what the letters to the churches say. What are we supposed to be doing at this time? Read what he says in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read what the what Peter and what Paul wrote in their epistles. Pay attention to the wording and what they're telling us we need to be focused on. And then look at the examples in the Old Testament. What those men did. Amazing. The Bible gives us everything we need. And though we already know these things are going on in this world, though we know what we used to be and what we used to do and who we used to hang out with, we know by the Bible we are not supposed to pay attention to those anymore. We're not supposed to make that the focus of our life anymore. Now it is him. He's separating out his people. He's drawing his church together under one mind, under one banner to call us away. The time is coming, and it's growing short. I know you can sense it. I know you can feel it. I know you see it in your own life. I know you see what's going on around you. And just like I do, you feel insulated from it. You feel separate from it. You feel like it, it, it's not having the effect on you that it does on everybody else. You feel like you're detached from the world. Yeah, I do too. Very attached. Very detached. And it feels weird. Because there's lots of things I see and hear that are going on, and I'm very indifferent to them. And, and I never used to be. I used to pay close attention to them. That's the Lord doing that. He's doing that in us. Because he's preparing us. Let me ask you guys. Are you all getting to a place now where when people are like, well, why aren't you ups upset about this? Why doesn't this bother you? Aren't you scared? And, and what's your general answer, either internally or externally? Well, I can't do anything about it. Why would I be upset about it if I can't do anything about it? I can't change it. What is getting scared or being upset going to do? How is that going to help it? It's just going to make it worse. I'll wait on the Lord. Yeah, that's where I've been going too. It seems like indifference. It seems, it, seems it's, it, it links a lot to stoicism, but it seems like indifference. It seems like you just don't care. No, you're just being real and honest. I see that problem. There's nothing I can do to change that. What is me getting upset about it and hollering and screaming going to do? Nothing. Yeah, that's where I'm at now, too. And it's been a, gender, a steady, steady progression for the last probably year and a half. It's not that I don't love them and care for them when I see people having problems. I can't fix it. I had some family the other day talk, and it's just like, oh, what do we do? We're we're three states away from them. There's nothing we can do. What are we What are we supposed to do? Well, you can at least act like it, it bothers you. Act like you're concerned. Well, I'm concerned, but just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Me getting upset isn't going to help them any. Me getting irate isn't going to help them any. I told the person, and you doing those things isn't going to help them any either. Why would you bring all this into the house when this is a thousand miles away from us? There's nothing we can do. Instead of getting upset, let's just be here for them if they need us. So, this is what the Lord is doing in us. Preparing us for heaven. Getting us ready to leave. <clears throat> cutting all those little apron strings that we have attached to the world so that we have nothing attached to the world. So that we are focused and dedicated to him and what he wants, to his word. Encouraging each other and ourselves. Building each other up. Being a blessing to each other and outdoing, like the Bible says, outdoing each other in blessings. Showing us ourselves as the people of God we're called to be, as the people of God we're supposed to be. So that no matter who the person is that sees it, can identify it. Merely a few words, a, a couple of actions. That's a Christian. I see that person. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing in us. Because the statement, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He doesn't want us to be attached to this, be dedicated to this, be locked into this. He wants us to be all those things to him. 
Because when we are, he comes and takes care, takes care of those other things. We need not have any fear as believers about anything that's coming. Any fear about who might be left and who might suffer. We need to be trusting in the Lord on all those things because if it is outside of our control, I can't make somebody get saved. If it's outside of my control, I have to trust the Lord. Because if I put everything I've got into him, I love them more by doing that because then that puts them on his radar. So I'm going to change my focus. I'm going to keep it on the Lord. And if I can grow closer, I'm going to grow closer. And it all starts with reading the Bible. It all starts with dedicating thought, dedicating some of your brain power to him, dedicating time to him, and he will naturally pull you closer. And you won't even realize it at first, and then all of a sudden you'll be like, wait a minute, I'm different. My thoughts are different. My attitude is different. My, my thoughts and attitudes and, and emotions towards others is different. Because he's drawing me closer to him, I'm becoming like him. It's incredible to know that that's happening and then to see it. And then to confirm it in the Bible. Amazing. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. And to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this word Lord Jesus, thank you for this love letter you wrote us in Song of Solomon. Thank you for this devotion. This devotion, again, the wording confirms a lot. The big confirmation we have here is you drawing us away, Lord. Spiritually drawing us closer to you, away from the world. And the further away we get from the world, our flesh starts to turn and go that way. Our flesh can't perfectly do it. That's irrelevant. We're going to get new bodies anyway. But we need to be spiritually attached to you. And this world does everything it can to distract us from that by playing on our carnal senses. Lord, help us to see that and push it away. To see, give us discernment to be able to see whenever something is playing on us carnally and we're like, well, wait a minute, I don't need to be in my fields for this. Get away from me. I don't want nothing to do with that. And to focus on you and what you have said, what you are directing us to do. To focus on us getting closer to you spiritually. Growing in grace. Growing in mercy. Growing in faith. The closer we are to you, the easier it is to be like you. The easier it is to take on your attributes, which is what this world needs to see. And so our light will shine on the bushel, not under it. Lord, help us to be these people. Help us to, to understand this even if it's in a basic degree, and see it so that we may develop within it. So instead of fighting it, like is what's our natural inclination to do, we recognize what you're doing within us. And I'm going to go further into this, and we go further into it. And then when the world starts to become less and less of part of our attention, we get less and less time dedicated to it and attention dedicated to it. Of course, there's things we have to do. Lord, make sure we we need to make sure we do the things we have to do, but that we will be much more dedicated and focused on you. Because what a blessing it is to everyone around us when we do that. What a blessing it is to the world that we conduct ourselves in this way, that we draw closer to you. Now, this particular time frame we're in is a little unique because it is right at the end. So things are happening a little differently now, but it still applies. We need to be spiritually connected to you. And this world is doing everything it can in its power to keep us from that. Lord, I pray that doesn't happen. I pray that we stay focused on you, stay dedicated to you, rely on you, look to you, trust in you, have faith in you in all things. Because if we can do that, like Peter, as long as he looked at you, he walked on water. When he looked away and looked at the troubles around him, the troubles in the world around him, he started to sink. Lord, grab us by the chin, hold us by the face, and make us look at you. 
so that we continue to walk on water, so that we walk in faith, in trust, in truth, and draw spiritually ever closer to you as this world advances and consequently draw further away from the world. You're drawing us to you. In this verse, you, you te you're telling us, come away, come closer. Rise up and come to me. Draw us to you, Lord, that we may be more focused on you than anything else and that that would turn out to be a blessing to everything else, to everyone else. It comes across, and a lot of people will tell us that we're being selfish. But it's a greater blessing for them that we do this. Because they certainly reap the benefits of it. Even though they complain about us. That's the way of the world. So Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you that we, we are receiving this. That this message, this intimate message is contained here in the Word. And we're able to look individually in each of our own lives. And look and see where you're doing this. And what a blessing it is. What an amazing encouragement it is to see you working so specifically in each of our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us this much. Thank you for caring for us and coming to us and directing our paths. Thank you, Lord, for walking with us, protecting us, covering our eyes, covering our hearts when we don't need to see or experience something but then exposing us to the things we need, thereby making us better and stronger. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for this free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. The Lord is changing each one of us and is doing it differently according to the lives we were saved in. He's got us on these little different parallel paths and they're all coming together to make that one narrow path and we're heading right to him. As we advance, as we move along, look at yourselves and look at the word. Think about what the Lord is doing. Look at your life and look at what's changed just in the last five years. See him drawing you closer to him. And once you see it, and once you start to grasp that, walk closer. Willingly go closer. Watch how fast things change in your life. Watch how fast everything around you changes. Watch how fast the people around you change. Without you really doing anything. Watch how fast your light, how much your light shines. What a blessing it is. What a true blessing it is. to be a part of what the Lord is doing. And to be made like him in this world for everyone to see. Because if we weren't here, if this world didn't have us here, what, what kind of world would it be if there were no Christians in it? Well. We're about to find out because the seven-year tribulation is going to more or less have that. Everybody's going to get a real good taste of it. So while we're here, let us be the Christians he's calling us to be. While we're here, let us walk in the way he's telling us to walk. While we're here, let us be who he is making us to be. Because not only is it glory to him, not only do we glorify him in that, not only do we bring honor to Jesus' name by doing that, but we bring blessing on those around us because when he pours his blessing out on us, they receive the overflow. And brothers and sisters, when he pours his blessing out, it is to overflowing. Verse in the Bible, it's mashed down, pressed down, pressed together to overflowing. So let us just, just be Christians in the truest sense of the word and just let the Lord work. And we will watch him ring out or wrought miracles in all of our lives. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I'll see you in the next video.